that brings us, that's our fifth pitch for the night, which brings us to uh, uh, our uh, time for a, a chat with Roslyn. If, uh, Roslyn, if you could come up and we'll, uh, we'll have a quick chat and, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully we've got some questions from the audience for, uh, who've been uh, thinking up some. Oh, so, well, is a streaming on for this? Yep. Hi, Mum. <laughs> um, well, thanks again, Rosalind, for, for being here. We, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, now, you started your online uh, electrical products business, Kogan, uh, back in 2006 from scratch, uh, from your parents' garage and of grown at uh, that business to revenues now of uh, over $200 million a year, is that, is that right? Um, you've also stormed onto a number of um, uh, most influential lists, uh, uh, including uh, BRW's uh, Rich List, which I think you've been on for the last, Young Rich List, sorry, which you've been on for the last three years. Um, for those who don't know the, the story, I'm just wondering if you could just briefly tell us uh, sort of how you started Kogan. Well, um, how long have we got? <laughs> that's like a, that's a 45 minute story if you go to YouTube and you type Kogan startup story, if you're really interested, uh, you'll be able to find that on there. But a quick summary of it is, saw that online retail is going to take off, uh, couldn't find a good price TV, w knew that it's a perfect product for online retail, you've got maximum value per cubic centimetre, so logistics makes up a small cost and worked out a way to convince suppliers to manufacture for me and worked out a way to be able to uh, get container loads of TVs without having any money in the bank account. So uh, if you want to fill in the blanks, go to YouTube. <laughs> so uh, so you've, uh, you've started the business then, um, but now for, for many businesses starting out and, and including for many in the room and also watching online, you sort of need customers. So how did you, how did you get customers? Well, look, there's lots of different ways to market and to win customers. Um, we believe that the best form of marketing is your core competitive advantage. So you flaunt your core competitive advantage. That's what separates you from the rest of the competition, what makes your business unique. And for Kogan, that's simple. It's price. We're a price leader in the market. We don't kid ourselves and pretend we're anything else. You go to Kogan to make a purchase because of the price. So the best way to win customers is to have the world's lowest price day in, day out in your store. And a proof of that would be sometimes we'd, we'd had in the past pricing errors on our website where, you know, our technology is constantly being developed. And I remember this one time uh, we had a pricing error on our Friday deal, which goes out at midnight on Friday. And uh, by the time we make it into the office um, on Friday morning, uh, there'd been over 7,000 of them sold already because the moment the pricing error had occurred, people go onto on, all the online blogs and forums, talk about it, mm. and yeah, through the middle of the night, that many of them sold. So uh, price is very important, but then also finding customers with the right intent is very important, and that's where digital marketing and very targeted marketing comes into it. Mm. I remember a mate of mine who's a mortgage broker a few years ago came to me with a problem and he's like, you know, every type of marketing I've tried just isn't working, I'm not winning customers. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, what, describe your customer to me. And he's like, well, it's somebody looking to buy a house and then they need to arrange for a loan and I've got the best deal, so that's the sort of customers I win. And I said, well, what sort of marketing are you doing? And he's like, well, he was taking out newspaper ads, radio ads, all that sort of stuff. And I said, no, capture the people with the intent. And I told him to go along to auctions and chat to the people standing around at the auctions. Mm. Because what do you know about those people? They're about to buy a house. And then he came to me the next week and he was like, mate, it's amazing. Um, you know, everybody there wants a home loan. I'm like, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> um, targeted marketing. What about those, those very first customers, though, when you, you launched the website? How, how did you get them? Was there any advertising or yeah, word so of mouth? Or? Uh, a few things. So there was uh, eBay. I was running one cent no reserve auctions. So 
um, that generated a lot of hype. A lot of people were like, oh, you're crazy. What if a TV sells for five cents? And I'd be like, well, does that mean not a single person in Australia is willing to pay 10 cents? Um, anyone who understands uh, you know, the principles of economics and free markets knows that if you've got a free market and you've got a lot of demand, as long as you've got two bidders on your product, it's going to get the right price. So when you go to a house auction and it's, the auction starts at $400,000, it ends for $673,000. If that auction started for one dollar, it'd still end for six hundred and seventy-three thousand dollars. So what this did on eBay is every listing had thousands of viewers, uh, hundreds of watches, lots of bids. The interwebs were talking about Kogan. I was running adwords at the same time. Very targeted marketing. Uh, the website looked uh, great. It had a one three hundred number that went through to my mobile. Um, you know, people think if you've got a one three hundred number, you're a massive business. They don't know it's like fifteen bucks a month. <laughs> um, so yeah, all all of these sort of things, and that started to get traction, and then word of mouth, and you know, bits and pieces here and there, and then here we are today. Yeah. So uh, when you've got those customers, how how do you how do you keep them, and how do you keep them coming back, and 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 building more and getting more? Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of an online retailer is you get to build a community around your products and your service. So if you walk into a big name store, uh, you buy a product, you take it to the counter, you walk out, they've got absolutely no way to contact you again. Uh, the, one of the biggest efficiencies for an online retailer is that marketing efficiency. People go into your email database, your Facebook page, um, you know, it costs next to nothing to to continue to remarket to these people and send emails and newsletters. But bottom line is, you've got to be true to what you're delivering in terms of a service. So mm -hmm. if we raise our prices by 20% tomorrow, uh, the millions of customers we've had over the last few years won't come back. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be true to your competitive advantage and then deliver on your promise. What about uh, competition? I mean, uh, there's a, a lot more online retail businesses that have opened up since. Uh, they've probably seen your business and what a success it's been. So oh. are you worried about the competition at all? No, I'm not really worried. I like it because it gets me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> um, the thing is, though, that a lot of people don't really understand online retail. Um, so, you know, people who aren't in online retail think that all we spend all day doing is sitting in that bank clicking refresh. And um, that, that doesn't take up more than half the day. Uh, <laughs> and others are like, oh, you know, I've got a bricks and mortar store and it's filled with products. Um, you know, I'm 90% of the way there to uh, being an online retailer. I've just got to make myself a website. And it's like, no, you're 0% of the way there. Understanding all of the efficiencies, digital marketing, um, and online retail is also a sourcing play. If you put the products you've got on your shelf on an online store, they're not going to sell mm -hmm. because somebody just has to Google that same product and find 30 other places that are cheaper than you. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot more involved to just, to just having a website. So mm -hmm. many have come and gone and many have tried and it's uh, fun to watch. What do you think about this term omni-channel retailing? Yeah. Uh, I don't bricks and mortar and a, and a website. Yeah. Uh, there's no such thing as omni-channel retailing and those uh, that claim there is are just trying to rescue their bricks and mortar business. For instance, um, there, there's no way you can price properly if you're an omni-channel retailer. So say, you know, you've got a store and the product costs $100, what do you charge for it on your website? Mm -hmm. The moment you, because that $100 takes into account the cost of running the store, all of the overheads, all of the inefficiencies. If you're going to charge $100 for that product on your website, nobody's ever going to buy it on your website because the moment they open a new tab, type that product into Google, they'll find it cheaper elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So then you've got to lower the price on your website in order to win that customer. The moment you lower the price on your website, why would anybody walk into your store? Mm. So there's a big catch-22. But the other thing is, people say like, oh, well, look at Apple. They're an omni-channel retailer. And you say, well, no, Apple's not an omni-channel retailer. Apple is a products business. They sell an awesome product. Mm. So uh, they sell it online, they sell it in their stores. If the new iPhone 6 was exclusively available uh, from the lion's den at Melbourne Zoo, it would still be the highest selling phone in the world. <laughs> now that doesn't mean the lion's den at the Melbourne Zoo is an awesome channel for sales. 
and you know let's write articles about it and this is the next big thing marketing managers watch out put your products in the zoo mm. if you put the new iPhones into 7-elevens uh, they'll be really successful as well they're a products business that is their competitive advantage you buy it because it's an awesome well thought out product mm. okay um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for for Ruslan yeah Oh, Michael, you nearly had your hand up. <laughs> um, that was easy. <laughs> uh, oh. um, comparing to that you sell something tangible as an item. Oh, sorry, we'll just get a microphone to you, Amanda. Hello? I don't think it's on. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I'm Armando from Energia. So uh, my question is, um, you sell things that are tangible, right? And you lower the lowest price because that's your competitive advantage. Uh, what's your advice to those people that sell software or sell ideas or things like that over, over the website uh, where they have that kind of competition? Yeah. Oh, well, look, we are price competitiveness was a clear choice of ours as that is our business path. Um, and it matters when you're dealing in a commodity industry. An iPad is an iPad no matter where you buy it. An Android phone um, is an Android phone. 32-inch TV is a 32-inch TV, so you're spot on. We're dealing in the commodity game that makes it easy for people to compare. If you're selling something else, uh, then price advantage isn't the right competitive advantage for your, for your product or service, so you have to work out what it is. My lawyers are not the cheapest in Australia, uh, probably the exact opposite. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason that they were chosen and um, you know, it's the service, the expertise, the what they provide. So being a price leader is not the right business model uh, for every single business. You have to choose based on the business that I have chosen, what should my competitive advantage be? Your competitive advantage may be an awesome product like Apple. If Apple raised the price of all their products by $100, it won't really affect their sales. Um, you know, you may choose service as a competitive advantage. Uh, you may choose flavor, you may choose something else. Whatever your business is, you have to be very clear as to what your competitive advantage is because that's the reason why a customer would choose you over someone else. Thanks, Sam. Um, with, your, um, with your learnings uh, in terms of Kogan, have they been similar with Milan Direct? Um, yeah, look, learnings, <laughs> learnings are probably, you know, one of the things we do is you learn something once and then you don't make that mistake again. So, um, you know, there's been, they're, they're two very different businesses uh, and uh, you know, some, some stuff in the past many years ago overlapped, some hasn't. Uh, but yeah, you, the most important thing with learnings is that once you learn something, uh, that that's an investment in your time, that you never make that mistake again because uh, otherwise it can bog you down very quickly. So we've made many mistakes over the years, but we look at every single mistake as a learning opportunity and then implement systems and processes to make sure it never happens again. So have you had the same results with Milan Direct uh, as with Kogan? They're, they're different businesses, so there's not, not much of them is similar and I don't have a day-to-day -day involvement in Milan Direct. Okay. Oh. Stuart? Yeah. So you wrote a bit, in, a bit of an article about how affiliate, uh, affiliate marketing didn't work out too well for you. Yeah. What digital marketing channels do work well for you guys and, and how? Yeah. The key in marketing is intent. You need to capture somebody with the right intent. And um, based on that, when somebody types buy LED TV into a Google search, that works out pretty damn good for us. <laughs> what about email? Email marketing, yeah. It's, it's good because it's free. Um, most free marketing channels work out awesome in terms of their return on investment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, online communities before. How influential have you know forums and that kind of thing been for Kogan? Uh, and do you, how how have you used them to activate and bring more users to your business? Yeah, look, we don't actively participate um, in all the online forums out there. 
Uh, we do have our Facebook page and Twitter where we have conversations going on all the time. But I learned the hard way when I was 23 years old when I just started Kogan. And, you know, I used to reply to people on all the forums and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, it's... There's a lot of keyboard warriors out there. So uh, you let them mingle amongst themselves and uh, let, let them sort their own issues out and don't try and intervene. Uh, but for us, we, we foster the conversation in, in our own communities, in our Facebook chats, in um, you know, our Facebook, Facebook or Twitter, our own blog, all of our, all of our own properties as such because uh, you know, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of critics of our business out there. There's a lot of people who aren't happy with it, mainly the big retailers and the bricks and mortar guys and all of that. And, um, you know, there's only one critic we really care about and that's our customer. Mm. Uh, anyone else? Oh, Janet, you, you, <laughs> Janet's got a question. Yeah. Uh, we have a management meeting uh, once every fortnight at Kogan and we list all of our growth strategies and what we want to do. Because the thing is, when you try and do everything, you end up doing nothing. So the last meeting we had a few days ago, there were 108 items and then we decide on the four we're pursuing that fortnight. And it includes everything from improving algorithms on the website to make smarter recommendations uh, to our customers to how we're going to improve our marketing, how we're going to improve our communication through to improving the website and then all the way through to international expansion and putting more products on our site. So on a high level, the most aggressive expansion in our business is going to come from uh, expanding our verticals and product range over the next year or so, but also uh, we're now in 15 countries and that list is going to get bigger by the end of the year. Um, if there's no other questions, I might ask the, the final one before we... Oh, sorry. I just just a little one. Um, considering you're kind of one of the richest young people in Australia, how do you return to community? How do I return to the community? Community, yeah. yeah. Because uh, you can. Sorry? Yes, because you can. Because I can yes. and I want. Yes. Um, so look, uh, there's a lot of things that I do. I employ well over 100 people. I think that's a pretty good deed to the community. They rely on Kogan to put food on their table. Uh, they've got an enjoyable place to work. They get looked after very well. They get to buy their kids Christmas presents. Um, so that that's one of the things that I do. Plus I do a lot of... Uh, other contributions on the side and give donations, but I don't shout about them or brag about them because they're nobody else's business. So uh, they're places that are important to me and it makes me happy I do it for that reason. So, yeah, there's a few that I do, but they're no one's business. Wouldn't you feel that would inspire others? With That's up to them. Okay. Like, where do you give to? <laughs> yeah. um, l um, about a million dollars to other people. You gave so a million dollars to other people? Yes, That's I did nice. the last 12 months, yeah. Your own money? Yes. That's nice. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I might ask the, the final question to, to wrap up before we have a break. Um, uh, Rosam, what advice do you have for other entrepreneurs, such as those in the room, who are out to disrupt established markets and, and business models? What, what's your advice to them? Yeah, uh, Look, I get a lot of entrepreneurs come to me all the time and I try and make as much time as possible to chat to them. And when I, when I meet with them, I try and help them evaluate their business idea. And there's three key criteria that I evaluated on. One is what is your competitive advantage? Two is what is your value add to the consumer? And three, does everyone else think you're crazy? <laughs> so, your competitive advantage ensures that you're different enough for people to, to want to transact with you. Um, that, you know, you're different to the rest of the competition and there's a reason for them to come to you. The value add to the consumer is what will trigger that transaction. That's the value I'm getting out of it. The other people think you're crazy when you raise the idea with them. 
uh, that ensures that you're challenging the status quo, that what you're doing is different enough to, to what, what others are doing and you're really changing the marketplace. Mm. And look, most people who come to me with ideas, their ideas are shit. So <laughs> uh, every now and then there's a person who has a really good idea. And I tell them, like, mate, that, that is an awesome idea. I think that's a great business. I think that'll really work. Mm. And I encourage them to pursue it. Then I'll see them six months later and I'll be like, hey, mate, how's business? And they'll look at me and they're like, what business? Mm. So it's very easy to talk the talk uh, and not so easy to walk the walk. So the thing that sets the real entrepreneurs apart are those that are able to take ideas into action. And the best business advice ever has been printed on Nike t-shirts for years. Mm. Just do it. Mm. Okay, thank you, Ruslan. Thank you. Thank you uh...